to the Assets and Infrastructure meeting. And um, we've got a deputation today from some folks from Kinnick and I, so I'll call you up once we've just been through a few bit of housekeeping here. Um, I have an apology from Brian Wilson, and uh, apart from that, it looks like we're all here, so I'll move it. Second by Councillor Stoltz. All in favour? Against? Carried. Anyone wish to declare any interests? Confir we'll move on to the confirmation of the non-confidential minutes. Moved by Councillor Burdett. Seconded by Councillor Foster. Um, so is any matters arising? <coughs> Including the action sheet and governance plan. We'll wrap them all into one. has been adequately reported to us. And it's arisen because of the new harvesting on small private roads during winter. And some people may recall that way back, it must have been in 2013, I put a paper up that asked for council to look at the issues around harvest of small woodlots on metal roads through the winter season. So when I couldn't, because the issue is about to rise again, I look on this agenda to see what it says about that item, which was around for several years. And I asked Council to, because it's not on the agenda any, uh, currently, but it was on, on a, I just grabbed another agenda out of my office and it still is on that agenda. So at what point did that item, which at the time, when I find the right page, appeared as, it was an item at the time, 13263, winter logging of smaller forest blocks and to investigate the issues of heavy traffic on vulnerable roads. So there was a report to council, um, 15393, no progress to date. Once decisions on the national environmental standards are determined, we can decide on the implications for managing the roading network. And I asked for that, to, um, if we could find out what happened beyond that. And it would seem that it simply has been deleted from the current action sheet, and I don't believe we ever have done anything about it. I mean, it may be that there, isn't an op there aren't too many options, but I would like to think that was reported back to us rather than just vanished off the action sheet. Thanks. So through the chair, the matter that Councillor Seymour was referring to went to the February 2018 Assets and Infrastructure Committee meeting, where it was marked down as completed at that meeting and approved by the committee for subsequent meeting. The closure of local roads is something that we now do as part of practice in roading for local roads. So there were numerous roads that we closed last year to public or we closed to forestry. It's done under our parking bylaw or all bylaws where we are able to limit weight classes of certain vehicles to local roads. So last year, for example, I think the committee is aware we closed Tariwa Road um, from about the 20k mark to public and leased it back to forestry for them to manage for the year. They obtained the maintain, maintenance of it and then handed it back to us at the end of the winter after summer, once it was back up to the standards that we wanted it to be. So closing of local roads is something that we are able to do under the current powers that we have now, and it's something that we're doing as part of um, our day-to-day -day maintenance. Thank you very much. But with respect, I didn't ask for the road to be closed. I asked for the, um, to investigate the issues, and it seems strange that no, I mean, we might have completed it based on the information you've just given me, Mr. Wilson, and I don't dispute that at all, but there doesn't seem to be a paper. It might have been closed off on the action sheet without a paper based on some kind of verbal report, because it would, a democracy have not been able to find a paper in 2018 to that effect. It's just disappeared off the radar, and it's less about closing the road, and it's more about you know, what is the message and what are we going to do about it? Because it is quite significant. And if we get, I mean, I mean and you know what I'm referring to, we get another bulk of harvest on a relatively narrow rural road for three to four months. Um, that's going to significantly damage the road. But I don't imagine for a minute you're going to close it. But, I, you know, it would really investigate what what potential controls, and though I know under our legislation, closed doesn't mean closed, it means limited in the access. 
and you're not going to be asking your said forestry company to maintain that road, I don't suppose. Can I just, we want to say something, Heather? Through you, Chair, the paper, the staff report that came with Councillor Seymour's paper did say that a policy should be developed for, to, and, and that the issues would be, should be investigated. And that hasn't come, and that it would come back to the committee. So do we, so can I further update that? Because that's part of the work that the strategic planning team's doing, looking at eroding maintenance costs and the equitable funding review, is the mechanism <laughs> that's going to be looking at how those roads are either limited access or increased payment for them to be able to truck through for winter. So that was the 4th of April meeting that council had where that paper went up and that recommended this, council approved the recommendations there of looking at those as part of the options for that funding, roading funding assistance and road closures and limiting as one of the tools that could be used as part and of And when do we expect to get that information, please? So when will that paper, piece of work be completed? So, sorry, I have to come back to you on that council to see what was a council decision. I just have the paper in front of me that it was coming back. The findings would inform the revenue and fin finance. Sorry, excuse me. The findings, the findings of the road maintenance cost and equitable funding review will inform the revenue and financing policy review, which is currently underway. Thank you. So yeah, we look forward to something to follow up with that. I take that yep. We'll note, we'll note that as another action. We'll put it back as another action. Any other comments with regard the, um, or questions with regard the confidential of the non-confidential action sheet and the work plan? Thank you. Right, did I put? Yes, I did, I put it away. Minutes. Good. Okay, I have no report to leave absence and I have no acknowledgements or tributes. So we'll move on to public input and petitions. And we've got Dan, he's going to speak on behalf of, of the people from Kanakanai. If you'd like to come on up to your, up to Dan and have a chat to us. Dan, this is Dan Hood, everyone. Long time resident of Kanakanai, probably all his life. I'm not quite sure, possibly. Heather's just going to hand out the copy. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Kanakanai Valley residents. I'm Dan Hood and I've lived in the Kanakanai Valley all my life. We are here to raise our concerns at the suggestion that a paper road joining the Kanakanai Road to the Hokaroa Road may be opened up for the purpose of forestry extraction. We are aware that no decisions have been made in relation to this idea, but would like to make, it, make our opposition to it crystal clear before the process begins. The Kanakai Road is already in very poor condition and we can look forward to seeing further deterioration over the coming years as forestry blocks in the Kanakai are harvested. We can't understand why trees grown in an adjacent valley should come down our road when it is not the most direct route to the port. We are aware that there is an issue with a section of the Hokaroa Road that is not up to standard for logging trucks. We are also aware that three forestry companies are willing to make substantial contributions to the cost of upgrading this section of road and cannot understand why the council has not taken up this offer. Surely it would be in the ratepayers' interest for you to do so. When you look at the population density overlaid with road condition, to us, it appears a no-brainer. The town end of the Waimata does have a number of residents, but the road condition compared to the Kanakai is far superior. The Waimata Road was upgraded to cater for forestry, increasing volume and logging traffic. Surely it's better to put high volumes of heavy traffic on the road that is most likely to cope with it, both in terms of surface quality and safety to other road users. Loaded logging trucks coming down the Kanakanai Hill cannot negotiate corners without entering each corner on the wrong side of the road, putting oncoming traffic in danger. There is a high traffic flow of private vehicles 
commuting daily to Gisborne. There are approximately 40 households situated from the top end of the Kanakai Road to the Kanakai Bridge, and 20 of these would commute daily to Gisborne either for work or transporting children to and from school. The last kilometre from the Kanakai Bridge to the main road is through a residential area of Tikaraka, including the Tikaraka Area School and the Tikaraka Play Centre. There is also a school bus operating daily from the, down the Kanakai Road to the Tikaraka Area School. Anyone looking to buy a property in the Waimata Valley over the past 30 years would have to have been pretty naive not to realise the volumes of timber that would be ultimately coming down their road. Just as in the Kanakai, we have some large scale forests which are close to being harvested. Many people who have recently purchased lifestyle blocks in the Kanakai had a clear perception of what they would have to contend with in terms of forestry traffic. This perception did not take into account the opening of the paper road and potentially vastly increased volumes of traffic. Another reason that we would not want to see the paper road open is that it would undoubtedly cause an increase in crime. While we have an, a non-exit road, we can monitor, and we do, the entry and exit of all traffic, and a through road would see mischief makers coming from either end. Thank you for listening to our concerns, and we hope you will take them on board. We also hope that you will keep us fully informed as the decision-making process moves forward. Thank you, Dan, and thank you for the people who came and supported Dan. Is there any questions um, you'd like to ask Dan? Thank you very much um, for your presentation. Is this um, specifically referring to the Hope of All Road, or are you also referring to any other um, inland roads north of that? Well, anything that connects, that creates, turns, transforms the Kanakai from a non exit road to a through road will be detrimental to us. It, uh, we'll just open a can of worms. Thank you. So to get it absolutely clear, what you're talking about is forestry, which is like adjacent to the Hokoroa Road, being re-diverted through a paper road out over their catchment into the Kanakanaia catchment, taking out the Kanakanaia Road. And that's, 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 that's what you're objecting to. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? Councillor yeah, Potter? Um, have, have you heard of, of this from forestry companies or? Yes, that's, that's where the idea has been floated, obviously, uh, because um, they've been directed out through the Taupe Parai Road and it, it adds $3 million, estimated $3 million to the cost of their transport, you know, and the extraction of those logs from one particular block. So obviously that is a major disincentive for them going that way, and they're looking for a cheaper alternative, which unfortunately is the Kanakan Eye. Any other questions? Oh, well, thank you for coming, Dan. The, the process is we can <coughs> answer questions at the stage. We, 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 we can't respond with our ideas. Staff can't respond to you. It's, 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 it's a forum where you make a presentation and we can ask you questions. So, um, so thank you all for coming. We've heard you and no doubt we'll, um, we'll have, a, have a look at this. And we do have, all I can, so, can say is that we are in the process of doing our our um, heavy traffic management sort of plans um, of where, where we will be putting trucks in the future and, and we'll, we'll, we'll take that into consideration when we do that. Thank you, Graham. We, we just wanted to make our position clear and we'd really like to be informed as the process proceeds. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you'd like to, you can stay for the rest of the meeting. It, it's, you'll find it riveting stuff, but otherwise, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> right. Well, um, we'll have a chat a bit later on quietly when nobody's listening. Um, extraordinary business. Anybody want to notice the motion? No, there was no adjourned business. So we get, we're right on to page 16 now. And that's the first report. Look, and before we go on, I've, I, I read through the report and at the end, I found it very wordy, very um, dealing with principles. And, 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 and so it sort of gave me the impression that one person could read it and come out with a, a result A and another person could read it and come out with a result B on the principles. So I'm going to ask 
Dave, if he would sort of just clarify it a bit more so we're really clear what's, what, what, what's going on here. So through the chair, this is the first stage in us further developing the compliance strategy for DreamWise going forward. As the committee is aware, this has been a topic that we've been working on and you've been, and so we the council and councillors have been grappling with for a long time. And this is around the approach that we would like to recommend to council as to how to compel people um, to be compliant with the standards that we need to for wastewater and stormwater on private properties. The report identifies that there are different levers for people to become compliant. Some people, once they're aware of the problem that they have in front of them, will actually do the right thing and will sort it out. Um, other people don't know how to do that, so they just need a bit of guidance. And then there are people who, no matter how much guidance, um, <coughs> for different reasons, are unable to comply with the new standards that we will be requesting of private properties. As the committee is aware, in our long-term plan, we have five point four million dollars um, set aside to fix and to put public drains on private properties and that's the work that's been happening with DrainWise recently this year. However we've also identified in the long-term plan that that was only half of the fix that was required. The rest of it sits with private property issues that really are the responsibility of those private property owners. This paper talks about how we would look to um, get some of those private property owners on board and it looks at different mechanisms from enforcement right through to possibilities of funding and those things. So I'll finish by saying the paper that we're developing up here is to be recommended to council for discussion at full council. And when we talk about financials and budgets, those are things that we would be looking to include in the next long-term plan. So this is us developing up with you what the next LTP looks like mm -hmm. around so where we've talked about things like um, funding against homes or rates, um, contributions, um, those are things that would need to be allowed for in the next LTP, not this LTP. So we're doing this two years out from when it would need to be included in your financials. So that's our way of introduction, but I know that the team are here if there are any further questions from the committee. Councillor Bidwell. Can I discuss this point? I had the uh, opportunity the other day of listening to Neville, <coughs> Wolf, and David as they presented the full picture and gave us overhead. It's very detailed, um, certainly uh, thought provoking, but I'm quite happy to move it. Having heard that, I mean, you know how exploring my mind is when it comes to difficulties about spending council money, but I think they've done the right thing here, and they, I, I assume I could be wrong. They're going to take the whole presentation to council at the next meeting. Thank you. I was at the same workshop that Councillor Bedit were at the, the um, working group, and we asked. It was a very, very thorough presentation and um, justification on on why we're we going this direction and a follow up from the white paper. So I'm happy to second this paper and recommend that it goes to full council for discussion and adoption. No, I, I am yeah, in following with interest the whole um, debacle as well, and the, obviously the ability to pay. Um, my, my question is, though, what demonstrates financial hardship um, resulting in the, you know, in the inability to pay? So through the chair, financial hardship is a term that's actually been defined by other agencies, and that's what we'd be looking to pick that up again. So financial hardship is something that's actually... Um, and I know I'm going to say the wrong government department, um, Working Income New Zealand is the equivalent now, um, have where financial hardship applies and there's a series of tests that need to be met in order for people to have um, community grants, services cards, um, things like that. So we would look to use the same criteria again rather than coming up with our own one and that would be what we would use to determine whether financial hardship applies. Right. The other one is too that you've got you know, a 250 hardship loan fund and also a 250 hardship grant fund Where's the differential between the two, and what would you, what would be the application? So, the fund is a grant. So, what we're talking about with the two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the hardship, that is a grant that doesn't need to be paid back. So, that's for people who cannot afford to pay back the loan at all. So, that's extreme hardship where someone has no money whatsoever. Mm. 
the other funders around making money available each year for people to put on as a loan against their yeah. rates. Part of what we're trying to do is manage our exposure of council and manage our debt by only having a certain amount available each year rather than having get it in, getting inundated by having more people sign up than what we would be able to fund as council would be able to have debt raised against. So it's to give certain people finances. It's also for us to be able to manage the number of projects that will be on the go at the same time and making sure that we can keep delivering them. You know, I understand that and I've read, you know, I've read the whole thing, but for me, who, um, when you, you know, there's obviously a line between where you are, avail you are eligible for a hardship loan and a hardship fund. Where does that line sit? <laughs> and who determines that? Through the chair, that's something we'll be looking for council to help us with that decision on. We're recommending that that would be something that we would work with government services around how we would come up with that criteria for people and they have a very set. The same thing um, with a lot of the um, assistance that the central government give, there are very clear parameters that we would look to translate across between someone who needs a grant and someone who's actually eligible and able to service a loan. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My questions really relate to some of the detail in it. And um, I'm looking at page 26 and the challenges. And we're talking here about um, the work would not be carried out by councils appointed contractors. And I guess that's a generalisation with respect to the paper. But I mean, I'm, there are approved um, providers of plumbing services. So I don't, you know, I think we shouldn't be too controlling because at the end of the day, we're going to determine what needs to be done. And I don't think we council should be setting itself up doing the work because it's talking about that in one particular place. Um, and it's suggesting that people might not be able to do it competently, would not be managed by council staff <coughs> and a lack of quality assurance and unfair costing would, pre would present a risk. I mean, seriously, this is homeowners who have some responsibility for <coughs> their home. And I don't think we should be taking away their right to choose their contractor to undertake a piece of work that we've designed, um, decided needs to be done. I mean, seriously, it's not like they've got no clues whatsoever. And I have another query on um, the spreadsheet page. I do think that, um, and this is page 44, looking at requests an extension of time from the standard three weeks to get the work done. I think three weeks is a bit short. I mean, so seriously, a mail out takes a week at least in this place, anywhere in New Zealand. So, I mean, are we, can we look at whether three weeks is the right period of time? I would think it might be six or two months because this is something, we, we've, we've talked about this for 10 years, but not everyone in the community has. So we need better publicity about it. And then we need a process that makes people understand that when their property has been assessed, this is what's required. They're going to need, some of them may need to go to the bank to get their mortgage, which has been alluded to in here. So it's not going to be three weeks to get the work done, I don't think. To the Chair, we're happy to take um, feedback as to those timeframes around responsiveness. We, if the committee wants us to take that up to six weeks or eight, that's no problem. It was a starter for discussion for the committee to... Look at. Sort of staff staff and find their money. Because if I really want you to pay them yourself and not pay Councillor McLean. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, three weeks is a very short period of time, and I appreciate the fact that we can bring some thoughts back. You know, just now I'm helping somebody get established or uh, doing a building consent for a new home, and she can't get anybody till September. You know, plumbers, electricians. So if that was relative to getting some drains fixed up, how the hell can you get it done in three weeks? And I just say, we need to expand. And as long as they commit that they're going to do this, I think we should accept that. Because this has been going on as long as I've been with council, probably years before that. So I think we should be expand our thoughts on that. So just to clarify through the chair, part of the three weeks time frame is reflecting that actually some of the, most of the fixtures are actually very simple quick ones. They're not all laterals that need replacing. They're not new pipes. Some of these are actually very simply downpipes that need to be moved. So we're literally talking about pulling a downpipe out of the gully trap and having it go somewhere else. So 
for a quick gully trip, which is something that, to be honest, we do for most people, um, depending on what they are. So a lot of the um, fixes are not major ones that plumbers need to be there. Just the other point as well is the registered plumbers absolutely understand that they have a level of care and quality that are there. But if we look at some of the fixes that we're getting across the network that have been put in by plumbers, they're not the ones that we would have approved and they're not the workmanship that we would have approved either. Chairman, because I hear the problem, don't we then have to be quite clear about the level of service that's required to repair this? Because, I mean, serious, there's no different to a road or steps on the Lawson Field Theatre or something <laughs> else that we are requiring a standard of delivery on. We just have to set the standard, monitor it, and make sure it's done to that standard. Through the chair, absolutely, Councillor Seymour, and it's part of us flagging up that we can't just assume <coughs> that plumbers who have taken these things on are the ones who are going to be fixing it. A lot of the downpipes that have been put into gully traps have been by the plumber who came around and did some of those things as well. But that would only be at the request of the landowner. If we make it clear what the landowner is required to do, it's not Councillor, stick it down the Councillor Dunn. Um, yes, thank you for this report. I really enjoyed reading it. It was really good. I took two key messages from it, wrote some notes. Um, it's nice to, for the recognition that the past solution of opening scale valves was no solution at all. All we did was spread raw sewage throughout our city rivers and to our beaches. I like reading that because it's something to acknowledge that it wasn't a solution at all. Um, and I like the part about the evolution. In the past two decades, we've actually been working on the wrong part of our system um, and haven't dealt with the real problem, which is direct stormwater going into our wastewater system and flooding it. Um, so I really liked reading those two things. Um, I picked up a couple of things here which I would like to see um, improved or added to the draft. Uh, the first one was um, on paragraph 37 on page 21, where it says that um, council needs to share a portion of the cost. I totally agree that council needs to share a portion of the cost, and I would add another reason for why they should have to share some of the cost, and that's because council historically is responsible for this problem in the first place. That this council in the past allowed houses to not have stormwater infrastructure. So we're actually fixing up a historical problem. Um, or in other words, we're, we're writing a wrong that we've made historically. Houses in the city should have always had stormwater infrastructure. That they don't is part of our regulatory problem. So that's another reason why I'd say we've got to cover some of the cost. Um, the second one that I would add is I really don't like the use of the word hardship. I would call it something else. Um, for example, wastewater wellbeing fund or something. People, not everyone is in hardship. Um, if my family couldn't afford to put in a stormwater pipe, it wouldn't be because we're in hardship. It just means we don't have any more debt that we can take out. So I think I'm just, I'm not convinced that hardship is the right word. I know what we're trying to achieve and I just challenge whether that was the right word. Um, and the other big thing that jumped out at me was the responsibility decision matrix. It's confusing. Um, page 24 and it's also on page 42 in the appendix. Um, it, it's coming across as very broad. I'm reading it like we're fixing every drainage problem on a, on a property, but the way I'm reading reading it is that it's a, um, it's specifically for direct stormwater inflow. So we're actually trying to address the fundamental problem we have here, which is direct stormwater going into our wastewater system. I wonder if we need to make that more explicit in that document. Um, what it says is we are fixing private property drainage issues. And to me, that implies we're doing all of the drainage issues. If there's stormwater coming off a road onto private property, it may not be overflowing the wastewater system. That's a separate drainage problem to actually council road drainage going onto private property that's flooding it, that's then overtopping the gully trap. So if the decision matrix is actually specifically to deal with the direct inflow, then we should say that and make it that explicit. Because I'm, I'm I don't want to solve all flooding problems on private property. I want to solve the ones that are directly affecting um, the flooding of our wastewater system. Um, and I would also add, this is just my personal thing I'd like to see happen, in the measuring effectiveness on page 38, 
I'd like 100% of our households in the city to have stormwater infrastructure and that it is connected to the public system. If we know that their wastewater stormwater is going to the stormwater system, we know for certain that it's not flooding our wastewater system. So I'll just say 100% of households in the city have stormwater infrastructure connected to, public, to the public network. Um, it's a great draft. Thank you so much for the direction we're going. Um, finally, we are tackling the problem we've got. And um, I look forward to the final, final report. Okay. Look, I'd like to just raise a couple of questions. And, and I might have missed it, but does, does any grant or loan come from, a, from the stormwater budget? So through the chair, the funds that are being talked about for either a grant or a loan are things that would be in the long-term plan going forward. So in the next LTP, there would have to have provision made for them. So there is no, none of those are set up at this current time. It's the next LTP and we'll be looking to take out a stormwater budget that would be asking for in the next LTP. Correct, but it would be, at that time, it would be recommended that it be a network cost. Through the chair to be up to that council at the time yeah, as to yeah. where that funding sure. came from, whether it was additional or met from within. Yeah. Okay. And and I have I I, I do look honestly I, I I I understand exactly where we are and there's probably going to need be a need for assistance and and uh, and I hear what Councillor Foster was saying before and um and I also hear like this hardship. What, it, what constitutes hardship. And, and so what you're saying is basically that will come back and there will be um, policy around how that happens before it's all done, is that, so that's. Committee that hasn't seen the presentation. The Wastewater Treatment Committee has seen the presentation. We haven't seen it at all, but we get to see it. Where the council sees we have to make the decision on it. On, we asked to on, make a decision on it now. Yeah. So can I clarify the presentation the councillors are referring to one is drainwise specific only. So it's talking yeah. about what we've done in the drainwise space. It's not necessarily yeah. related to this paper. Okay. The yeah. drainwise which was presented. So um. So that's that's my only thing. You know, like I, I, they talk about grants, and I think well, I'd I'd, I'd rather see assistance. I know that some we're going to need to give some people assistance. But that's that's a fact, and I'm happy to do that. But with something like an interest-free loan over five years on their rates, be a better deal than a, a thing where they have to fund. Because again, if you just give them loans with rates, you've got the ability to purchase it back if they don't pay it. You know, like there's there's actually a requirement. Whereas a normal loan. If people default on it, we don't have that clawback. Whereas if it's tied to their rates, we do. And so I'm, I'm sort of thinking maybe, and also by doing that, it makes people, no matter what their situation is, take a little bit of responsibility. I know it's, you know, if we spread it over rates interest-free over so many, a few couple of years, everybody has to take some responsibility for their situation. And we know that these people actually own the house. So they're not, we're not talking about the person with absolutely nothing. You know, I know, again, you might talk about elderly folk. Well, there's a bricks and mortar scheme which they can borrow against um, the life of their, to, to, and, and, and so I'm, I'm, while I know we have to be compassionate and while I know some people will need help, I also think we need to make sure that everybody has some responsibility. Can I ask one further question with respect to the housing New Zealand units? Have they all, are they all compliant now? or some of those still to be? So through the chair, so the housing New Zealand houses where we've identified properties, we're working really closely with them to fix them. Um, it's part of it as we work through and getting all of the issues fixed and then alerting housing New Zealand to those as we go through. But we have a good relationship with them to fix the problems as we find them. Thank you. Councillor's thoughts. I want to make one comment um, about the presentation that we saw. I remember way back when we spoke in the, in the white paper and spoke about the type of relief like Councillor Thompson is saying now um, on rates or grants or whatever, that staff then told us that if there are four roofs that are that whose pipes go straight into the gully trap, that can cause uh, uh, overflow, um, just four houses. 
And what caught my eye when, when they presented to us that they've already removed 25 pipes out of gully traps. So it's a massive amount of work. If you take into account that four can cause such a big problem, they've already just in the short while 25. So that, that was really impressive to see the, the, the scope of work that you've done and what a big difference. Excuse me, can I okay. finish? Yeah. Right. Rude. Um, just um, one of the things I didn't say was in the responsibility decision matrix in paragraph 53, um, where is the water coming from? The rainwater flows from a neighbor's property. I was wondering why the, par the first paragraph in the next box down doesn't apply in there. So for example, it says if the rainwater flows from multiple neighboring properties, um, council will, the property owner will be required to ensure roof water is connected into public networks. Why is that same paragraph not in the next row up? Like, shouldn't the first thing we do is ensure, if, if my property is flooding my neighbours, first thing we should ensure is that I actually have the stormwater infrastructure on my property. Um, so I was just wondering if that paragraph could also be put into the next one up. So it's just, it's, um, it's fair. So if I have got all the proper infrastructure and I'm flooding my neighbour, geez, what's causing that is something completely different. One person's stormwater or rainwater should be flooding the next neighbour, and council does attend to that, yeah. I believe. I, I think we've already done work on that, and also oh. we've identified that if it's a multiple good drain on private property, then it, then again that that's um, going to be mm. a cost of to us rather than the cost of it because if you know like that neighbor if it's a multiple good over some a handful of properties so i think we've, we've been there and done that i think is that correct? I, I actually hadn't finished so and i was also going to follow on from what councillor stocks was saying that we are taking these down pipes out of the gully traps that's not actually the full fix they've got their uh, down pipe going into the gully trap because they don't have stormwater infrastructure so we're we actually enforcing them to actually put in a stormwater pipe to get it off their property, or are we just removing the downpipe? So through the chair, there are a couple of things that you've raised here. And it's about our approach when we are working with catchments. And we have taken a catchment approach for the last couple of years. What Drainwise team have been doing recently has been dealing with the multiple properties that are flooding one property in particular, or we have multiple properties that are entering into our wastewater network at once. And that's that public drains on private property approach that we have. The second part of what we're doing is we're rectifying something that we had done previously as an organisation where we asked people to just pull their downpipe out of the gully trap and left it at that. Now we're talking about not leaving that property until we know where that downpipe is feeding into. So putting it into council stormwater or into infrastructure that we know can actually manage that water going forward. So part of the DreamWise program absolute focus <coughs> is making sure that it's the right fix for that property. One of the things we don't want is to end up with, pri with properties that have ponding on them. While that ponding might look like it's fine because it's not entering our network from the surface level, however, it's increasing the groundwater underneath where we also have a number of cracked laterals that run from the house out to the street. So any ponding on private property is actually of a concern with us as well, which is why we're trying to work with property owners about how we make sure we take care of all of their stormwater at once rather than leaving it as one piece, one piece, one piece. So Neville and the team have called it a one-touch approach where we go to the property and we talk to them once and we deal with all of the issues before we move on to the next one. It can take longer working with them to make sure everything's covered off. However, it means that we know we don't have to go back. Because if I take the downpipe out, you might move in and get sick of the water being on your lawn and go, I've got a really good place for this and put it straight back into where we don't want it to be. And we have had that on multiple occasions. So it really is making sure that we deal with the problems once and once and for all we go there. All good. Right, it's been moved by Councillor Burdett and second by Councillor Stoltz. Unless there's any more, I'll put it. All in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you very much for that. And we'll go on to page 50. Yep, right. 
Bless you, my child. Before we get a response to that, can we just, would, would you mind if I got asked you just to hold the question and we'll just go, because we've, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six different um, headings here, st starting on page where we are. And shall we just run through them one at a time and we'll, 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 we'll pick up your question when we get down to stormwater and on page 82. So if we start with um, rivers, lands and coastal, are there any, any questions on rivers, lands and coastal that anybody wants to ask, any comments or any, you like? Well, I'd just like, yes, sorry, I'll just always go to Anta. And since this is a rural issue and the Uawa ward was substantially affected by the June 18 flood damage, it tells me that we're um, substantial fencing repairs and the clearing silts and drains and culverts is nearing completion. I understand there's some work going on in, for June this year around the Mangatuna Road, but I've still got a man unhappy about the fact that his fences have not been returned and they weren't washed away by the flood. They were taken down on Kauke Parai Road to enable access to one of the three bridges, five bridges collection, and that fence has not been repaired or restored and they've been left with a couple of pieces of tape. So what is the, can we expect those to be tidied up with ASAP? Through the chair, I am aware of the property the council is referring to, and as I understand, it's been taken up a fencing contract that has been out to price it and get it done. Brilliant. Thank you for following that up because it's been in here for two, two or three months. Okay. Any other on land, rivers, and coastal? Yes. Yeah. 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 Right at the bottom there, the old perennial, David. Different groups, but bash parties in your career, including transport agencies, are considering using the unused dollars and no response from the transport agency. Exactly what has happened to date? No response from the New Zealand Transport Agency. So we have followed up um, and we're waiting to hear back from them and it's contingent on their funding and a number of other projects within NZTA that we're waiting on. You can assure me they're not going to disappear in the night down the road. Thank you. Without being paid for. Right, so unless there's any other questions on land, rivers, and coastal, we'll go to solid waste on page 60. Councillor Stoltz. Um, on page 64, we talk about um, getting ready for summer and how recreational services um, know that there's more work and they will get re ready for summer. But this year, we need to take into account that we need to tidy up our city significantly in September because we have got the Teha commemorations in the beginning of October. So I just wanted to flag that, that even though it does say we know we need to get ready for summer, this year we will need to pull back those timelines and do that work in September. Through the chair, we have got a team that's preparing for Teha and making sure that our city looks its best when we get to the Teha celebrations. Thank you. Consistent with that request, is there any flexibility in the street cleaning contract to sweep the road under those palm trees that we have in the main street when they drop all their little beads? Because I think it gets swept once a week. And some days in the main street, it is seriously untidy because they, if there's been a bit of wind, they fall off by the thousands and then they're spread all over the ground. They're not very large, but they do look really untidy. And most places we can sweep. And so is there flexibility within the contract for them to respond better at certain times of the year? 
So with that Andrew White here, I am aware that they do increase their sweeping during um, seed dropping time on those palms. That it is something that we do try and keep across, but they do increase it. But they do look good. Thank you. Any other questions around solid waste? Just uh, pages 60 to 69. Yes, Mr. Chairman, on page uh, 61, three paragraphs down, one of the land thought I must compliment, compliment Wayne on his patience. Uh, you had one meeting there in Rutoya, they, they tried to arrange a second one with an advisory group. Three quarters, though, almost seven eighths didn't turn up, so it's, it's been moved out. But then if we go to uh, page 64, <clears throat> the second item down, decision to be made in the Waipa land foreclosure, no decision has been made. And the advisory group, now, what uh, last meeting was decided that they, Tauroa, Tegarek, Rutoria, and Togamara Bay would have two representatives each on this advisory group. Get it, Wayne tells you rather than me. Um, to ensure that the Landfill is looked after, and it is. I mean, but the contractor does a very good job, but there are more issues around it, and it might be better if he spoke briefly about where, where exactly the council is on this one. And how the people are going to be chosen? Because yeah. it's the first time I've heard about the Mara Bay interested. Well, Lead, one of them, they were both there. Yeah. Okay. Councillor Stoltz? No, are we going to have the answer? Oh, sorry. Sorry, um, to the chair. Uh, yes, we um, had our um, second meeting with the Waipu uh, group. Uh, we um, have asked, um, well, the group had asked about representatives from the other communities that went, went there, and we're going through the process of um, engaging with um, these communities through council meetings. Uh, I think we've um, spoken to the Progressive Association in Tiaroro, and they have a couple of representatives that they um, want to come along to the next meeting, which is um, in July, middle of July. <coughs> Councillor Stoltz, does that answer your question? Yeah. I'm on um, page 67, and something when I, I talk to residents that come up all the time is what do we do with our e-waste? And I remember we have had some days where we could drop off for a small fee. And I was just wondering if going forward, if we can have a few of those days again, because um, computers and cell phones and um, stuff like that needs to be recycled properly. And then just following on from that, there's a lovely gentleman in town and there was a feature on him in the paper recently and um, who takes old refrigerators and ovens and micro microwave ovens and he takes them apart and for 15 or $20, he come and pick it up at your house and then he, he recycles it and donate all the money to cancer research. And I was just wondering, we need to use these clever people in our community at, as a council at the front desk, if people ask about stuff like that, I do think it's important that we use this guy who's doing a service in our community and um, get his contact details and, and make sure we um, use someone who's willing to do some good work in the community that in the end also helps us. Thank you. And then just those e-workshops, or those e-drop-offs, if you can maybe think of that, because there's a lot in our town. Well, thank you. Thanks. Do we have the answer? Yep. So someone wants to Sorry, um, chair. So, so that was just the, around the e-waste. Uh, so we have had a um, e-waste collection through the Tara Fiti Centre. So um, it was a place where you could drop off your e-waste and then we would ship them through to Tokoro to a uh, group that are dismantling the e-waste. Um, there's been a few changes at, at Tarafiti Environment Centre, so we're working with them around um, either continuing that service um, or, as you say, we may have to look at some sort of collection Supplementary, when we had those days, Dwayne, there were tons and tons and tons. I worked at the day with a little high vest, tons of stuff delivered. So those stuff are sitting at people's homes now. So I really think we need to be proactive and, and organize a few of those days. And then we ship it off to Tokarua or whatever we used to do via the Environment Centre. So I would encourage you to follow up on that. Thanks. Thank you for that. Look, um, 
while we're on 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 solid waste just on the e oh, sorry. so on the e-waste just to clarify just to manage expectation the e-waste days were very heavily subsidized by the ministry for their environment mm -hmm. and it's something that they're no longer doing so e-waste subsidized collections from EFA are a thing of the past so there are definitely some user pays for some types of e-waste where you can pay to have it um, done in a sustainable way. There's also mobile phones through Starship, which the money from the mobile phones puts donations towards Starship. But the e-waste days are something that would be extremely expensive for council to put on without having central government subsidising. Perhaps a supplement to my earlier question, even though it might then not be a, a council issue, the problem is just going to get bigger because we all use stuff all the time. So then we need to advocate MFE to say there's a big need in our town, it's costly for people, otherwise stuff are just going to end up in the dump when it can be, be recycled. So I would want to urge staff to look into how we can maybe then get MFE to get back on board and fund some of those days. I know it sounds easier, to see, easier said than done. Can I just support that? And maybe we've left our run too late, but it could have been something that those that went to the local government conference could raise, because this government is keen on removing rubbish from the environment, and that's something that could be supported by um, government so that MFV do it again. Because like Councillor Stoltz, I spent some time at, um, on that collection day, and it was just incredible. The number of TVs and computers and stuff that came out of the boots of cars and went into railway carriages, if I recall. Um, but it's something that MFE needs to be um, encouraged nationally to undertake again. So maybe you can bring it up at um, the at local government you know, NZ conference. So it would need a remit, I would imagine, to not give it any legs. Supplementary. Next year, we can, uh, if we're still around the table, we can do a, a remit to local government then because the problem's not going anywhere. Yeah, well, well, well would, it's very relevant to... Um, Last week, when I was down at um, Rural Provincial, and if, in fact, a, um, the issue was raised there, and there was a large iwi group in the central North Island, large central North Island um, um, district, had been discussing with the council, and, and the, their mayor and chief executive raised the issue and used Jim's agents there. And unfortunately, there's, 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 there's ideological barriers, I, I believe, blocking blocking it and they, they talked about the, the iwi were looking at building a, a co-generation plant for the, for the waste that couldn't be recycled and, and, and they were told by the MP at the meeting that the problem would be that if they built that they would actually end up taking waste that could be recycled as well and that would actually and recycling has grown into a, a big industry that employs a lot of people and you know, so you could see they had these I, these 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 um, blocking the way a little bit. And it, whereas the, the the concept was a good one, and um, it, and it, you, we've got to get it past the uh, powers that be in the in that round in the round building. But um, so so yeah, it was a little bit disappointing. And, and following on from the presentation, um, once the um, the member had left, there was quite some dissatisfaction with the answers that we got around it um, uh, expressed. Councillor Stolt. Back to what we discussed earlier, Mike, what we discussed, uh, an action item on our agenda, the um, e-waste stuff, so that it doesn't just drop off um, going forward, but we um, make sure it stays active. Is that okay with the committee members? What would be the best? So what's the action item, sorry? About the e-waste investigation, Lead will look into it. Lead and Wayne. And also to do a remit going forward. Because due next year, people might have well forgotten about this. I, I just think it's worthwhile again, adding I, Again, it. I think, and I, I, I noticed anything that's successful with regard to putting these forward, and I note this attending the rural and provincial, was to get collaboration with other councils. Um, <coughs> and um, and and we had the same issue with the um, with the foreign owner farmland thing. And when I got down there, it was it was big on the agenda with several other. And that it was already on the agenda down there. And there were several councils, and apparently we'd been asked to, but we 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 hadn't been involved for some reason. So I got involved, whether you liked it or not. <laughs> yeah, so um, 
So yes, I, I think that that, um, that that collaboration with other councils would be a good idea if you're going to do that. Okay, if there's no other questions, we'll go on to Tairafiti Roads, page 69 to page 82. Any, any? Mr. Wilson, has the contract been let for the remake of the Wiggins Bridge on Tauwhiparo Road? Through this year. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Put a sad and face you were going to um, <laughs> yeah. make a public announcement, I hope, because it's a very significant bridge for the infrastructure of a large section of that community. Um, I don't know this is done, bridges fit under number two, so I don't feel bad about asking it. When is it likely to start? Uh, so through the chair, we are looking to put out a public announcement about that bridge and working with the contractor about the dates, closes, um, what sort of traffic management we'll have to put it under and all of those things so that people can work the logistics around that. So the team is just working on that and then it'll be, a, it'll be announced. We'll just work with the contractor on those details. Excellent. Thanks. Well done. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, what about <coughs> drainage and improvements in Colwick? My husband says he's RFS this several times. And he's concerned, but says it's underway. Colbert's and water table on rural roads. Do we know where the contractors are and where they're planning to go next? So the rural community have got a bit of an idea what to expect. So through the chair, one of the things we're working with our contractors around is showing the interactive map of what works are underway, what's been completed and what's scheduled for each financial year. That's something we're looking to roll out with the July 1 data to show exactly where we're going to be um, for the drainage and for the works that have been approved across the network. So I might just take from that supplementary that probably nothing started yet. <coughs> it says through, underway, but it's Through the chair, we've done $1.8 million worth of drainage so far this financial year that we're in at the moment. So how will we know where that is? So, I mean, are, we, are you able to report, you know, provide that information that it's been done on XY roads and ABC roads can expect it to happen next? Through the chair, one of the things we're working with our contractor is, <coughs> and as part of local roads being in-house is being able to show you that board rolling three-month work program in far more detail so that you'll be able to see that. More than happy to bring back a um, presentation that can show you what we've been doing where so far and then include the board works from that as well. We'll just need to work with the contractor around how we're going to do that. Otherwise, it's just massive spreadsheet. Thank you. Any other council? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm not wrong from being a very harsh critic of Tairafi Roads to having seen a, an improvement in a short time. They've been uh, told that they're still in existence. But one of the questions to David, and I specifically asked this one last time, in terms of you said the drainage, the water taping, the verge mowing, and the spraying. This is not the right time of the year to be spraying in those villages. But it is basically, it still is non existent. So, in terms of the new contracts, what are Downer's responsibility across the network in terms of what I've just asked? Because I've had to repeat three times a request for service in terms of water tabling, and despite the diplomacy at the other end of the phone, absolutely nothing has happened. This is over a four month period. So through the chair at the June 27 council meeting, we are meeting with you to discuss the levels of service for a number of the things that we've talked about. So you can know what the level of expectation is going to be so that we can set that through our new contracts that we're going to have with our voting contract. At the moment, we're at our end of financial year and we're negotiating what that's going to look like in the new environment once voting comes back within house. So under, as we've discussed at the future Tata Pity meeting, there are a number of changes happening with voting and we'll be working those through so you have greater visibility going forward. Very good. Councillor Foster. Things on page 75, uh, and <clears throat> right at the top, a commitment, upgrade rural roads with industry and transport agency support to enable log harvest. Uh, on the other side, progress, where possible, we have been trying to attract third party funding for some forestry projects. Um, what, what third party funding is that that we're trying to attract? Is that PGF or are we looking at the industry? So through the chair, that's where we have NCTA share. We've been working with a number of forestry companies and private landowners around them paying the local share for the roads repair or for new roads. 
So NZTA has commitments for it and we're working to make sure that it's somebody other than ratepayers that are paying for that upgrade or for that stretch of road that's having something done to it. We have, yes, we have. We've had forestry companies who have paid for the local share. We've also had some that have done and paid for works as well. Um, we have a very big one, of course, um, up the back of Taupari Parai, um, where we're working with the Link Road, and that's working with GHL and a number of landowners up there around third-party funding for that road as well. The other one is it, um, on there as well. It's uh, complete a network efficiency investigation to consider best heavy vehicle routes. Um, is, is this the card down report that we're still waiting on? And when will we likely to be seeing that, do you think? Sorry through the chair, I don't have anyone here from strategic planning to answer that. I'm not aware of the time frame, so we can get back to you on that. Okay. Further more to that, is there, are we waiting, like are we now waiting for it to be involved with um, spatial planning and, and one thing or another, because that really has been on the agenda for probably 18 months, two years that I know of. And like, you know, we've gone and had meetings around issues of, with, with the heavy route. Um, so is there actually a reason why it's taking so long? Through the chair, the heavy vehicle route needs to include what we're doing within our spatial plan. So the spatial plan is something that's our overall driver for what it is that we're doing. It's one of the inputs that goes into where that heavy vehicle route's going to be. There have been a number of workshops held um, with council and with staff looking at the inputs to that heavy vehicle route and it'll be how that gets developed up and brought back. Like we had a workshop, I think it was two weeks ago with our writing staff, and there's more inputs before it comes back up to council for for you to consider the outcome of that. Thank you. Just don't know the actual date, but sorry. Writing? Yes. Yep. Council yeah, no, I understand it's going to be quite a bit of work undertaken on the East Cape Road. However, at the end, and I see it occurs in, earlier in the, in the agenda, that the Department of Conservation are responsible for the parking area and turnaround. Where are we with this? Because uh, the community there is <laughs> quite uh, loud in their complaints about <laughs> the whole area. Sorry, through the chair, I sit next to one of those family members um, in my office space, and they do mm -hmm. remind me of a constable. Well, she comes from there. <laughs> she certainly does. Um, so that is something we're working with Dot and the adjacent landowners to look at fixing up that car park and making sure that we can get it wider. It is around us doing some detailed work to what it looks like. It's not just filling in the coal, but it's what's the long-term plan, it's what Dot wants to look at. So it has been progressed, it's just taken time. Thank you. That has been raised since um, January of last year, at least, seriously, because um, the coal is so short. It's very difficult for people to turn in the dark, and many of them are there in the dark if they're planning to walk up um, the steps to see the sunrise. And I think we should be giving it a level of urgency, especially if we're going to improve the road to a degree, then we're going to have more people going out there. So I know that part of it is private land, isn't it? And, it's, and there's dock involvement as well. But, you know, we do take so jolly long to do things in here sometimes. So to clarify, the coal that you're referring to, Councillor Seymour, is not a council coal, but it is a dock one, which is part of the delay as getting yeah. dock to come to the party. Mm -hmm. to but nobody, the public at large, don't understand that it's a dock coal, but they try to turn around in a piece of road, which they perceive to be a council road, and I know it's not, but, you know, we just should give it some priority. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, if, you, if we're done with Tyra Fitty Roads, we'll move on to urban stormwater, and we... I just do Sorry, Mr. Chairman, before you move off it, without having to say anything further, I do draw your attention to the level of, on page 77, the level of um, satisfaction with the state of our roads, both urban and rural, and I'll say no more. Is it something we don't already know, or has it gone up? I know, but this is written this time. <laughs> right, so, okay, that's, that's... Mr. Chairman, I just wonder if you can add and 12 months out, have a look at the same results. But if we take back control and the amount of uh, resource that David tells us, contracts that are going to be instigated over the next 12 months, we should see a marked improvement, especially on our network. Good. 
Okay. Then, right, urban stormwater. Now, we're, we were halfway through a question around about 11% of capital expenditure to date. Is that correct? And you were expecting an answer or along those lines? Councillor Seymour? No, uh, yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. That was reported this morning, and it is the um, capital budget to... Um, I'm trying to find if it's actually got a date. But it actually says stormwater is only 11% of 155,000 out of 1.4 million. And at finance this morning, we were having a conversation about um, the capital projects. And I perfectly understand that the capital is not ratepayers' um, rate money, but the servicing of that capital is. And quite aside from that, there's a level of um, performance that has to be sheeted home somewhere eventually. Um, and so council needs to truly understand and we were told that it was probably all going to catch up by year end. My colleague who was sitting next to me this morning, our independent advisor to the Finance Committee, reminded me that we're now at the 12th of June and the year end is the 30th of June. So can we have some understanding from this committee how much of the stormwater budget we can expect to see spent by year end? And if not, why do we budget with that kind of level of funding if we're not going to do it? And we've been practising this for years, so we should have it more finely defined, I would hope. So through the Chair, the capital under expenditure under spend in stormwater is related to three projects, and in fact it's actually in the one in particular that's the issue, and that is the Rutini Road stormwater project is delayed. That's $1.3 million worth of under spend that we're currently expensing is there. We are going to spend some of that money for Rutini Road before the end of the year, but we're going to have to carry over. The other two are due to contractor availability. The works are underway, but the budget won't be spent. And those are the two projects. One's for the Douglas Street stormwater improvement, and the other one is for Parkinson Street. So with those two projects, they have been done in... So, sorry, Parkinson Street and Douglas Street, we have contracted, we have them underway, but we won't have them completed this financial year. They will drag into a couple of months of next financial year, so we have to carry the budget over. The total budget for CapEx for water is 2.8 million, and we're going to be requesting a carrier of 1.3 million because of those three projects in particular. So why does it say um, 155,000 versus 1.4 million, which is reported on the finance papers on page 128 for stormwater? Sorry, through the chair, I've only got my access and infrastructure agenda, which has the stormwater in front of me here. So, I mean, we, we can give the answer some other time, but that, that's what's reported in the finance papers and when you're trying to marry them up. So those are spent today versus, that's forecast today and spent today against. Mm -hmm. So that's why you don't see the full, I've got the, and the right. R1 has an infrastructure, it's get the full year rather than forecasted spent today. So this is three, no, I don't think it tells us that year, you've got that information, but it doesn't tell us on that page. Fine, thank you for that, we understand those projects. Any other questions on... Urban stormwater? Comments? Answers? Every one of those communities has major stormwater problems. And they constantly complain about them. Who would have determined that? So Sorry, through the chair, that would have been set in the LTP budgets when the budgets were put through for that, and that's to spend as we go per day for those. So that's fixed. Supplementary, Mr Chairman, fixed in the long-term plan. Is that my understanding? Neville, please. Uh, through the chair, the um, we're doing a, a total review of the township um, stormwaters right through on the coast for all townships and looking at all the maintenance and capital requirements to inform the next LDP. So we're looking at integrating both the roading input and also council's input with the um, rural township budgets. So we believe it's, it has been um, underfunded and we are actually, the part of that review is looking at all historic complaints and trying to identify hotspots and upgrade work, future upgrade work. Thank you for that. The next time someone gets in my ear, I'll refer them to either you or David. <laughs> right, thank you for that. Okay, so urban stormwater, all done and dusted. We'll move on to wastewater, page 90 to 97. Any questions? Comments? 
Councillor Seymour. Yes, again, um, from this morning's finance committee, the wastewater um, project is reported at 59% spent, 2 million and 3.3 million. Are we expecting to catch that up by year end? Through the chair, we have some projects, again, as we did with stormwater, that are due to contractor availability. They will be part way through. Um, so we have had one which, for example, Russell Street Rising Main, it's 60% complete, but we've had to move the contractor or bring them back and they'll spend the remainder of it. And then we have um, Tolaga Bay septage, which we have to carry over due to ongoing negotiations with landholders. And then our processing and receiving area at the wastewater treatment plant, which was $200,000. We've proposed that that gets carried forward because we're going to be doing the upgrade of the wastewater treatment plant sooner, so it wouldn't be prudent for us to spend that money just as we're about to change it all up again. Thank you. The septic site at Tolaga Bay was not used for quite a few years, wasn't it? So um, what, we are thinking of using it again? So for clarity, sorry, through the chair, we're looking in the long-term plan, there has been provision made of $300,000 for a new area for the septic trucks to be able to dispose of their waste further north than Tolaga Bay. We call it Tolaga Bay, but it's within the Uawa area. Right. Um, it'll be further north than Tolaga. Not and it's the one that was previously used, because that was closed. Yeah, it? and it's to stop the truck having to come all the mm. way back to Gisborne to dispose, sure. so it's around making it cheaper and easier for coast residents. So when you're negotiating with the landowner over there. Thanks. Oh, good. Okay. Folks, and if there's no other wastewater issues. Where are we with that, Dave? Actually, I might defer to Wolf if that's all right, Chief. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Um, are you asking about the budget spend? So we have. Um, that money being spent at the moment. We have consultation and engagement processes going on um, with EWI and um, with the broader community. In terms of EWI, that work is um, well underway. In terms of the broader community, we're putting together a stakeholder engagement plan to inform next year's um, work on that. Thank you for that. Right, we're going to water supply, page 97. And that's the last one. It relates again to a report in the Finance Committee this morning of 44% of the work completed, 450,000 spent, rather than um, potentially 1 million. And I can't, it isn't really clear, I'm trying to find exactly what that answer might be from the report in here. So can someone tell me what's happening there or not? So through the chair with drinking water, we have been progressing well with the major capital there, which for this year is the UV plant um, upgrade at Waipawa for the water supply there. That's mm. quite a big hit that that plant has actually been installed. So we're expecting that to be 100% spent by the end of this financial year. There will be a small carryover um, in capital expenditure, and that's due again to weather delays and also around contractor availability to be able to deliver some of the things that are there. But we're feeling confident about how it's moving forward. Thank you. Anybody else? And just the safety improvements at Manapuiki Dam, and we understand that's programmed to be completed this year. Is that still on? Through the chair, yes, those, those improvements are underway now with our contractors. Okay. Well, if, if someone would like to move the paper, Councillor Burdett, second by Councillor McLean. And unless there's anything else, I'll put it all in favour. Aye. Against. Carried. <coughs> well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your... I suppose you can... Is that okay? I had a retail manager approach me yesterday, and he said he nearly went flat on his face with our footpath in Peel Street. They've been marked and crossed for years or for months, and now they're cracking and they're actually floating all over the place. And he was asked me when is that going to be remedied. I said, I'll ask a question. Through the chair, Peel Street is on the improvement plan for the 1920 financial year, so we do have works that we're looking to complete before the car of this year. That's only six months away. Thank you. 
It's three weeks away, the new financial year. Thank you. <laughs> right, so, so thank you very much. Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, well, thank you very much. We're just going to ask um, if we can just have a chat with Dave on on a couple of other. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to actually while you're here I'm going to suggest I and you would have um, met with a, a young young man some few weeks ago Tony Lasky about or oh, some graduation program or something he came down from Auckland and you you were comparing yes okay and he he's been he was an ex Gisborne boy went to high school here. And he's been in Auckland and around the world ever since. And he's got a new job and he came down to Gisborne just recently. And I was talking to his father, who was my cousin in Taupo. And he said, oh, Tony was saying, what a wonderful, Gisborne's looking wonderful. So that was a, that was a nice compliment. Yeah, he knew, he just said he just went around the city and he was absolutely impressed with the place. So, so take heart to that, yeah. Thank you, Ryan. So I'm going to declare the meeting closed here yeah, and we're just going to um, have a wee chat.